Good afternoon. I, I love TEDx for so many reasons, but one of them is that people come here and tell us how their dreams came true. And I want to share just the opposite. From the age of five, I decided I knew exactly what I was going to be do with the rest of my life. I was going to be Superman. Yep. I had all the qualifications. I was young. I was fit. And I owned my own cape. This is what inspired me. The United States Treasury Department presents The Adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman. Strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth justice, and the American way. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, yeah. That's entertainment. So here's how that would work. I would be five years old, and I would, I would watch that show every night. It was on a while, so it, it was on reruns in the Chicago area. And I would go and grab a towel, and I would be transformed. This is your Instagram moment right here. This is, I expect it to show up on social media all over the world. Yeah. Things happen, though. When I talk about dreams being dashed, I matured. I turned seven. <laughs> and I realized that I was not leaping tall buildings in a single bound. Tall shrubs were a challenge. I couldn't bend anything in my bare hands. So I began to think, do I have a fallback? Because if I'm not going to be Superman, how can I fight for truth, justice, in the American way? And it occurred to me, I might be able to pull off the mild-mannered reporter. Clark Kent became my new hero. Yeah. You, the bio was very gracious, but didn't mention I've spent the majority of my life as a newspaper editor and journalist. I was the uh, editor of my sixth grade paper, my eighth grade paper, my high school newspaper. I published the, uh, the uh, Devil's Advocate, the underground paper, when they used to have those in high schools across America, and worked in newspapers all across this country until I became editor of USA Today in the aughts. Uh, and honestly, when I was seven years old, I decided I was going to be Clark Kemp. I didn't have his build or anything, and I certainly didn't have didn't have uh, un colorful underwear that he wore, but, but, but it was a role model for me. And it was not unusual, not at all unusual for people of my generation to see journalists as heroes. I'm going to give you a couple examples of that. After all, who was Spider-Man when he was not slinging his webs? He was Peter Parker, photographer for the Daily Bugle. And then there was the crusading Green Hornet and Cato. Green Hornet... Uh, was a guy named Britt Reed, and by day, anybody know what he did? Newspaper publisher. And then in television and in movies, there were heroes galore. This is my favorite, Deadline USA, a movie from 1952. And, and this poster, by the way, is in my office and has been in my office for about 25 years. And uh, anybody seen this movie? Raise your hands if you have. Oh, great, I'm going to have to recreate a scene for you then. <laughs> The final scene is my favorite scene, and, and Bogart is this crusading editor who has crossed the mob. He's going to publish a story that reveals, reveals a scandal that the mob is behind. And he's standing in the press room, and the mobster calls and says, listen, buddy, you published that story, you're a dead man. I don't know when, I don't know how, but you're a dead man. And you see Bogart on the phone, and there's a roar behind him. And the mobster yells, what's that noise? What's that noise? And Bogart says, it's the press, baby. The press. And there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. 
Excuse me, I just had a chill. <laughs> and in the movie, it closes there with the battle hymn of the Republic. So whenever I feel like American journalism is in trouble, I pull out that film and watch it. And of course, I watch it every single day. <laughs> Something has happened in America. You know, it's easy for me to say, but I find that my fellow journalists are among the most idealistic and honest people I've ever met. And a lot of people are making their decisions about what they see on MSNBC or Fox or whatever polarizing cable channel. They, they say the media is biased. <laughs> there are 60,000 journalists across this country. They don't meet every Tuesday night at the National Press Club and plan the domination of a free society and good and noble professions, many of which you've seen on this stage over the last two days, are routinely denigrated now. You know, you've had scientists here, but you know, you can't trust scientists on that global warming stuff. You've had professors, no, they're elitist eggheads who think they're smarter than everybody else. You've had judges, judges, disagree with an opinion by a judge and he's politically biased, has nothing to do with applying the law. For some reason, America's heroes we prefer them to be targets. And we have stopped trusting people who are among the most trustworthy in society. Why is this happening? Well, here's a clue. I do a lot of uh, interviews about the First Amendment. Uh, media outlets call me, and, uh, and, uh, and the First Amendment Center is a nonprofit, nonpartisan. Uh, our only official position is we're in favor of free speech. That's our radical position. Anyway, the phone will call, ring, and I can remember this call. Uh, with <laughs> every word of this call, I had a booker from Hardball who wanted to get me on the air. And so the Supreme Court decision this morning, aren't you just outraged by what the Supreme Court said? And I, and I responded and said, well, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, and there was a pause on the other end of the line. <laughs> and the booker said, well, do you have the phone number of somebody who's just outraged? <laughs> That's what we're up against. And here's what's so disturbing. Here's what's so disturbing. The reason this is a great nation is because of the five freedoms of the First Amendment. And I'll talk about that. Uh, and, and in keeping with our comic book theme, I'm going to share with you the First Amendment's secret origin. It's a moment in American history that everyone should know about, and no one was taught in the fourth grade. It begins, of course, in Philadelphia with the Founding Fathers. This nation was in terrible condition in the 1780s, right after the Revolutionary War. Our economy was in shambles. Men who had fought in the Revolutionary War had not been paid. There were debtors' riots. There, were, uh, there was armed rebellion in Massachusetts. There was a real question about this very young nation, could survive, who could, whether it could survive at all. And the Federalists said, we have a plan. We need a strong central government. And it's going to have an executive branch, a judicial branch, and a, and a legislative branch. They'll balance each other out. This, is, this should all sound somewhat familiar to you. And, and they put this together in a blueprint to reboot America. They didn't say that, but that's essentially what they're doing, starting the country over, replacing something called the Articles of Confederation. And, and so when they put this plan together and took it to the American people, something you've never read about happened. The American people rejected the US Constitution. They said, no, thank you. We do not want a strong central government. Had one before, called a king, and that did not work out. So we reject the idea that you're proposing. But then something happened. There was a growing recognition of the need for change. And they did something they no longer do in Washington, DC. They compromised. <laughs> the American people, through their representatives, essentially said this to the leadership behind the US Constitution. We get it. We will give you the power you're seeking, but hey, you've got to give us some guarantees. You've got to promise you won't put soldiers in a home in peacetime. You won't subject us to unreasonable search and seizure. If we're accused of a crime, we have a right to a jury trial. We like guns. We demand a well-regulated state militia. And above all else, we demand the right to worship the God of our choice to say whatever we want, to participate in the marketplace of ideas, to move this country forward by being able to speak freely. And want to be able to gather together in the town square and assemble freely? 
and you may not shoot us. No more Boston massacres. And if this country isn't exactly where it needs to be, we demand the right to petition government for redress of grievances. In other words, ask for improvements and changes. One more thing. We have no idea who you're going to name president. Could be George Washington, for all we know. But we don't trust anybody with that much power. We demand a free press. A free press to keep an eye on people in power and to watch out for the rest of the Bill of Rights. Journalists will help protect the rights we're demanding today. And without that, without that guarantee, we will not ratify the U.S. Constitution. So that's what truly happened. Elementary school teachers are, have so much to do, they probably don't often tell you that the Constitution flopped when it came right out, when it, when it was, was pitched in the first place. But what is so critically important is that there is a sense that the Founding Fathers gave us these freedoms. You, you hear about the gift of freedom. No, we demanded it. We said no go on the Constitution unless you give us these promises. We negotiated for the Bill of Rights. We own the Bill of Rights. We made a contract that still needs to be upheld. I want to share with you just a few suggestions about how collectively and individually we can help make a difference. It is an incredibly difficult task ahead. We are live in a jaded society where we're, we're at each other's throats and it doesn't appear we're going to make any progress. I would suggest that one of the things you need to do is invest in real news. If you're worried about fake news, think about buying news, paying for a subscription, digital or print, buying magazines. It's simple economics. Those of you who live in Nashville, and I assume most of you do, you saw what happened when an entire generation decided no, to lo no longer pay for music. 70% of this town's songwriters went home because they could not make money anymore. Record companies shut down because the industry had suffered such a blow. When America decides it will no longer pay for news, democracy gets shut down. It's simple economics. If you have half the people paying for news, you have half the reporters, and you have the, half the accountability from public officials. Please consider making your donation to democracy. Next, don't join a team. This may be my most radical suggestion here today. It is easy to identify yourself as being a Republican or a Democrat. I get that. Part of a team. But you know when they plot the election, when, when somebody's running for governor or senator, they, they look at the, the political topography, and they go, OK, there are this many Republicans, and there are this many Democrats, and there are this many independents. And over and over again, you hear this, independents will decide, right? Independents will tilt this election. What if 75% of us are independents? If that's the case, they can no longer take us for granted, and they actually have to debate these issues. They have to discuss with us what's important for society, knowing full well that their answers will determine how we vote. We cannot be blind to political allegiance. We have to think for ourselves and take a stand. Next, share stuff of substance. The miracle of the internet. It is, it is astonishing, right? The web, the social media, it is so much fun. There are people in this audience right now trying to figure out which member of the Gilligan's Island cast they were on their cell phone. Um, <laughs> pet photos, all kinds of great things. But imagine if every day each of us said, you know what, I'm going to share one article. One article that explained something I didn't understand. One article that made a point I'd never seen before. I understand you will not get as many likes, and you may not get retweeted, but if just one person sees that, that's one citizen who is smarter, more committed, and more engaged with society. Next, know why you know. This is interesting. You know this thing called common knowledge? Um, it's stuff that everybody knows, right? But have you ever thought to yourself, well, why in the world do I know that that's true? And, and I want to give you the best example I can think of. Betsy Ross. If I put a table out front of TPAC here and I said, you can win a, a flat screen TV. All you have to do is come up and tell me who designed the American flag. And that first hour, everyone would say Betsy Ross. That first day, the rest of the year, everyone would say Betsy Ross. <laughs> because we all know that Betsy Ross designed the American flag when, in fact, she did nothing of the sort. Total fraud, no evidence whatsoever. And yet we all know that Betsy Ross designed the American flag. The truth is that her, 
<laughs> her grandson William, went to the Pennsylvania Historical Society. And, and to be clear, Betsy was a seamstress at the time of the Revolutionary War, so there's some historical grounding. But William goes to the Pennsylvania Historical Society and gives this great speech, fabulous speech, passing down this legend that had been shared in his family for years. It was such a good speech, it went viral. Do you have any idea how hard it is to go viral in 1870? <laughs> and the reason it went viral is because women in 1848 had gathered in Seneca Falls, New York, and said, we've had enough of this. We demand a voice and we demand a vote. And the women's movement began in America. It intensified after the Civil War. And women were fed up. And yet those who said women should stay in the home, they shouldn't work, they shouldn't vote, they shouldn't run for office, they don't need to be heard from, could point to Betsy Ross and say, look at that. This woman was a great American, and she stayed home and sewed. That's why it went viral. The rest is history, sort of. Generate light, not heat. It's kind of a second cousin to what I shared earlier. I'm sure we're all frustrated. I know I am. I have friends that I've known for 40 years who post things on Facebook, and I go, I don't know this person. Uh, and, and it's so hard. Uh, and the temptation is to unleash a deadly meme on them. <laughs> and then it occurs to me that maybe it would be better just to send them an article from the Washington Post and say, why don't you read this? To the extent we can reach out to people who are still capable of being persuaded with real news and real information and real respect, I think we can make a great deal of difference. Next, what for dinner and, and why for dessert? This is just a plea to all of you who are parents or about to be parents that you sit down at the dinner table at least once a week and you explain what happened in the news today and you talk about current events. And after you talk about what happened, make sure at the end of that dinner you take a few minutes to talk about why it happened and why people of good faith might differ on what happened. It's critically important if we're going to create a more respectful society among the next generation. I, uh, I think it's probably the most important piece of advice I could give you today, and it certainly is for your kids. And finally, the media we deserve. I want to point out, I hear this all the time, and I'm reflexive in my defense of the news media. I am, because I was in it for so long, and I know the good people who work there. But it always strikes me when people say how horrible the media are, how shallow, how sensationalistic they are. You know, it's a market-driven medium. Television depends on ratings. Radio depends on ratings. Newspapers have to sell copies to sell advertising. I'm often asked about what television broadcast I respect the most, and it's PBS NewsHour, right? It is substantive. Yeah, only TED Talk attendees watch it, actually. <laughs> but it is substantive, it is fair, it is dull and boring. And if all of us, all across America, stopped watching the channels that engage in the journalism we disapprove of and started watching PBS, and suddenly those numbers got to be 20 million higher and 30 million higher, there would be strategy sessions at every network, everyone saying, how can we be more dull? How can we be more boring? And how can we tell people information for a change instead of just trying to inflame them? Uh, I, I have to... We've got to make freedom and democracy the coin of the realm. We've got to be talking every day about these core freedoms and why they make this a great nation. And, and, and let me tell you why it makes a difference in the long view of history. The Founding Fathers, I'm sure, were great fellows. We, we bow to them and salute them all the time. But um, they screwed up. They didn't free the slaves. They didn't give women equality. It was only because we had those five freedoms of the First Amendment. We could speak, we could march, we could publish abolitionist newspapers. It was those five freedoms that changed America. We did it. And if you're not happy where the world is today, if you're not happy where America is today, we have five incredibly potent weapons to speak out freely, to make a difference, to make America greater by making America smarter. 
And I ask you today, do whatever you can, wherever you can, to take stand for the marketplace of ideas. America is a place where freedom makes all the difference. It is not a coincidence that the most vibrant, creative, powerful nation in the history of the world is also the most free. We need to defend those principles every single day. And one more thing, never give up your cape. Thank you very much.